Right, good, good evening everyone and greetings in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus. Um, just excited to, uh, again tonight to continue our Bible study and to hear from the Lord again. Um, mm -hmm. And, and what, what the Lord has got planned for, uh, for our lives and this foundation that we've been hearing of that He's building in our lives. Um, uh, and the title tonight, God's Foundation Stands Firm. And it's, it's so important that we have a firm foundation. So I just want to, uh, before I hand over to my brother, just want to um, commit us into, uh, in, in prayer to the Lord. And I just also want to mention if, if anybody has any comments or questions, um, we won't be able to get to, uh, to your questions or your comments during the recording, but we will get back to you and comment afterwards. Okay, so let, let's just open and pray. Father, we come to you tonight in Jesus' name, and Father, we just thank you so much, Lord, that your foundation stands sure, Lord, um, and you've given us that foundation in your Son, the Lord Jesus. And Father, as we hear your word tonight, I just pray again, Father, that, Lord, we would somehow esteem your word as much as what you do. Mm -hmm. Father, because your word says that you've magnified your word even above your own name, Father, and Lord, we don't want to, as the saying goes, move with the times. No, Lord, you've given us your word. You've gone through so much effort to give us the written word. You've given us instructions, <coughs> Father, how to live this life. And Lord, just as we heard before, as you gave Noah specific instructions how to build that ark, and the instructions for the tabernacle, and everything, Lord, in your word, you, you weren't vague, you gave specific instructions. And so too, Lord, this foundation that you're laying in our lives is specific, and, and it's written in your word. And I pray for, for us tonight, Lord, as we hear your word. I pray for those who might join us and, and hear your word, Lord, that they would not just only hear the words and think it's the words of a man, but, Father, receive it from you, mm -hmm. and, Lord, also then just go and search the scriptures for themselves, Father, mm -hmm. to see whether these things be so. Mm -hmm. And Father, we just thank you for the privilege it is even just to handle your word and just to be able to hear from you, Father. Mm. Um, so we just commit ourselves and our time into your hands now. And Father, we pray, glorify your name in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Good evening, everybody. I preach you all in Jesus' precious name. It's a great joy to be able to share God's word with you tonight. And as Delaray said, we've been so excited with this foundation series that we've been sharing on. And we've been hearing recently of the, particularly the principle of the baptisms. Um, and the scripture makes it a plural specifically because there are more than one baptism. And we've heard about being baptized into Christ um, that is our salvation experience that's when we give our heart and our lives to the Lord Jesus and we've heard of being baptized into water um, water baptism itself uh, doesn't save us it's the Lord Jesus who saves us and who gives us new life but water baptism is is really our answer and our outward declaration of that work which the Lord Jesus has done in our lives and our commitment to to follow him and uh, to serve him with all of our hearts and then as we heard last week the great need of being baptized into the Holy Spirit and to know his fullness and his power in our lives um, that we may be the witnesses that the Lord Jesus wants us to be and of course there are many wonderful things that accompany the presence and the infilling of the Holy Spirit um, the Bible speaks of the gifts of the Holy Spirit um, and it's just a, a, a great joy for the child of God to know his power and his influence and to make us the the witnesses that the Lord Jesus wants us to be 
So tonight we're going to just talk about the fourth baptism um, that the Word of God speaks of. And it's the principle of being baptized into the sufferings of Christ. Now this is not a subject that's often spoken of and surprisingly not many uh, see this principle in, in the Word of God, but yet it is such a crucial part um, of our walk with the Lord Jesus. And I do pray and hope that by just these few scriptures we look at tonight, that we will see the joy of this principle and not view it as something negative, but actually something wonderful that the Lord Jesus is doing in our lives. In the book of Matthew, chapter 20, the Lord Jesus speaks concerning this principle quite clearly. And if you look, Matthew chapter 20, and if we just read in verse 20, it speaks of an occasion when uh, the mother of two sons James and John came to the Lord Jesus and they worshipped him and the Bible says they desired a, a certain thing of him. They, were, they wanted to ask him a question. And Jesus said to, to the mom, he said, what, what do you want? What are you asking? And she said, Lord, can you grant that these two sons of mine may sit with you in your throne, one on your right hand and the other on your left hand in your kingdom. Now that was no small request. Um, but Jesus said to her, he said, you don't really know what you're asking. And it's not really my place to, to give that. But he answers her question with a question. And he says, are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I am to be baptized with? So Jesus speaks of baptism here and he links it to this cup, uh, a cup that needs to be partaken of and a baptism that we need to be baptized with. And he asks them this question, are you able to drink this cup? And are you able to be baptized with this baptism? And very boldly and I think quite surprisingly they both answer and say 100% we're able. We're able. And then you read on in the book of Matthew, and if you go across to chapter 26 of Matthew, Matthew chapter 26, and in verse 36, and the Bible says, Then Jesus came with them, and he actually had these very same men with him, James and John. And Peter was there too. And he came to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, Sit here while I go and pray a little further on. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. And then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry here and watch with me. Now, I'm sure we are very familiar with this account and this experience that the Lord Jesus had. Uh, it was very, very close to the time where he was going to be crucified. And here he found himself in, in great anguish. In, in the Garden of Gethsemane and crying out to his father. But his desire was that these disciples, James and John and Peter, would stand with him 
and would pray with him in his time of of anguish. And you remember, as we, we said just now in chapter 20, James and John both said, Lord, we're willing, we'll drink that cup with you. And so he goes on a little further and he falls down on his face and he prays. And he says, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And then he came to his disciples and found them asleep. And he said to Peter, What? Couldn't you watch with me even just for one hour? He says, Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So the Lord Jesus was really teaching them and is, is teaching us a very, very important principle that uh, we really need him. Our spirits are so willing. James and, James and John were so quick to say, yes, Lord, we'll, we'll do anything for you. Peter said the same thing. But the flesh is weak. And folk, the truth is, as human beings, it's always wonderful to enjoy the good things that God has for us or the good things that God gives to us. But it's so sad that many, many children of God, for them the wheels come off when they start to hit hardships and start to hit hard times and suddenly they begin to question God and, and wonder why they're, they're going through these difficulties. I've even heard people say things like it's r absolutely wrong for a child of God to suffer. A child of God should never suffer. He can just ask God for anything and God will do it. Now, you know, that's such a lie and, and such a deception and it throws so many precious children of God into huge turmoil when they begin to suffer for the sake of Christ. And here these disciples, it was the same. They were all big mouth and all keen and, and thought they could do anything for the Lord Jesus. But when it came to the crunch, and when it, when it came to this garden of anguish, where they now had to drink that cup, as it were, with the Lord Jesus. And you know, the Lord Jesus said it was just for an hour. Just watch for me with one hour. And they couldn't even do that. Uh, they, they failed when this trial came. But you see the Lord's response to this cup. As a man, as a human being, because that's what he was when he came here, the Bible says he became a man. As a man, his natural desire was for this cup, and it really was a cup of suffering that he was going to partake of uh, as, the, as the cross lay just very close ahead of him. Naturally, he was praying and saying, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Now, you know, that's natural for all of us. None of us want to go through suffering. But I think the crucial key to this whole principle is what the Lord Jesus said next, when he said, but nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And folks, that is the, the crucial lesson for us to learn in this principle. If you go with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 5, we'll just read a couple of verses there.
Hebrews chapter 5. And verse 7 says, speaking of the Lord Jesus, who in the days of his flesh, in other words, when he was here on earth, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears. Now that's what was taking place there in Gethsemane. This Hebrews 5 is a direct reference to his experience there in Gethsemane. He made prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death. And he was heard in that he feared. So did the Father hear the Lord Jesus' prayer? Well, the Bible says yes. But did he take the cup away? No, he didn't. Because the Bible says that even though Jesus was a son, Hebrews 5 verse 8, yet he even learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Jesus learned obedience by the things which he suffered. As a human being, he learned to say, Father, not my will, but thou will be done. Now, you know, when you read things like that, and they're there in God's word so clearly, and you ask yourself, if the Lord Jesus had to go through that, and if the Lord Jesus had to drink of that cup of suffering, don't you think we will have to do the same? Don't you think we need to learn obedience as well? Yeah. Obedience was actually <clears throat> already in the Lord Jesus because he never ever disobeyed his father. He was perfect. He never sinned. He never fell short. You, are, you and I, on the other hand, constantly struggle. Uh, we completely forsook the Lord. Um, we didn't want to know anything. We didn't want to have anything to do with Him. We just wanted to live our lives and, and do our will. We, we just wanted to fulfill the lusts of our flesh. We had no regard for the Lord or for His Word. But now that we've come to Jesus... Now that we've surrendered our lives to Him, is this not a crucial principle for us also to learn obedience? And you know, when it comes to doing our will versus doing God's will, that's where the conflict takes place. Is that not so? That's where... We, we, we begin to experience this suffering because we have to deny what we want and we have to give place to what He wants. Just as Jesus prayed, Father, not my will, but thine be done. I really believe with all my heart we need to be praying that exact same prayer. Mm -hmm. And learning that exact same principle. Father, not my will, but thy will be done. Peter says this, if you would like to turn with me to the book of 1 Peter, chapter 4. <clears throat> 1 Peter, chapter 4. In verse 1, the Bible says, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, he says, Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. So it really leaves us with no escape. If Jesus had to learn obedience and had to suffer in this way he says 
arm yourself with the same mind, you and I will have to do exactly the same thing. He says, but here's the joy. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Isn't that a beautiful thing? In fact, isn't that our, our desire as children of the Lord? You know, we don't serve God and obey God because we have to or because we are forced to. We, we desire to obey God because we love Him Amen. and because we, we want to do that which pleases Him. We, we don't want to walk as close as we can to the edge, mm -hmm. uh, as it were, to the edge of the cliff. Um, one, one foot in the world, but one foot in, in God's will. That's not our desire. Our desire is to be as clean as possible. Yes. And, and not to a allow sin to have its filthy influence in our lives. We don't want to have our, our robes of righteousness spotted by the world and by sin. So he says, this is, this is the joy. That if you will give place to this principle and have a desire to obey God and earnestly say, Father, not my will, but thou will be done. It's going to cause suffering. But it's going to also cause us to cease from sin. He says here in verse 2, that we no longer should live the rest of our lifetime in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. Folks, you and I have to make a choice. We need to decide whether we want to keep living according to our will and the lusts of our flesh, the lusts of men, or if we want to live according to the Father's will. That's the choice. You can't blur the lines. Unfortunately, today in Christianity, we see such blurring of the lines. And men think that, that God is there for their pleasure. And whatever they ask, God must do it. God must make us healthy. God must make us wealthy. God must prosper us. God must take the suffering away. Sometimes we think God must do a thing just because we've asked Him. I pray that God will change that attitude in our hearts. Because that is a worldly attitude. It is a fleshly attitude attitude it is a sinful attitude that at the end of the day we are actually just doing our will we want god to do our will but i pray that god will change it and bring us to our garden of gethsemane experience where perhaps our hearts need to be broken but that it will bring us to a place of surrender. No one enjoys that. Nobody wants that. But folk, when you see what it does, if suffering is going to bring us to a place of surrender to Jesus, then I say that this is a good principle. And this is something that is needful in the, in the life of every child of God. Let me read another verse in the book of Philippians. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 2. Look what the Bible says here about the Lord Jesus. I'll just pick up in verse 5. Again, he's speaking to us. And he says, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Now what was in his mind? What was in his heart? Well, let's read it. It says here in verse 6, 
that he, being in the form of God, Paul says in uh, Corinthians that he was the very image of God. And even though he was God, and thought it not robbery to be equal with God, yet he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross now I wonder how many of us are willing to walk that same path. I pray that God will put it in our hearts tonight. There's a beautiful principle that the Lord Jesus speaks about. Um, you read about it in John chapter 12, where the Lord Jesus speaks about a seed. He speaks about a, a grain of wheat. And he says, if that grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it will bring forth much fruit. But he says, if it doesn't die, it just abides alone. It will just remain a seed. Now, you know, if we are willing to take hold of this principle and stop trying to exalt ourselves. You know, th th there could never ever be anyone more exalted than the Lord Jesus. He was God. He is God. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He was the very image of God. There's no one more exalted than Him. And yet Jesus Himself chooses this path he chooses this path to to humble himself not to exalt himself when he came to earth he didn't come riding as a as a king with great grandeur and and great ceremony and great pride he chose rather to degrade himself he chose rather to give place to the will of his Father. Father, not my will, but thy will be done. It's such a crucial principle. You, you can also read this again. It's the same principle. But in the book of Luke chapter 12, you'll remember there, there was a, a rich young man. Let me quickly read, read this to you. Uh, Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, uh, there was a man who, who had great increase and great wealth. And in verse 18, you, you read the verses previous, and he said, I've got so much wealth, I don't know what to do. He says, I'm going to break down all the bonds that I have, and I'm going to build greater bonds so that I can have space to, to keep all my great goods and then I'll be able to say to my soul soul you have much goods laid up for many years take your ease eat drink and be merry but God said to him you fool this night your soul will be required of you then whose shall those things be which you have provided. So is he that lays a treasure for himself. If I could say that in another way, so is he that does his own will and does all that he wants and makes no place for God. He lays up treasure for himself, but he is not rich 
towards God. Mm. Like I say this, I just read that verse again today and it so touched my heart and just caused me to, to pray in my own heart and say, Father, I want to be rich towards you. I don't care about this world's riches. I don't care where I live or, or what car I drive or how much money I have. Those things mean nothing in eternity. What's important is that we are rich towards God. What's important is that we are fruitful for God. What a tragic thing if God should come to, to the tree of our life and see that we are barren and to see that we there, there, there's no fruit because all we've done our whole life is our own will. We are not rich towards God. May God really put that desire in our hearts tonight. There's one last thing, if you don't mind, but just to share with you from the book of Hebrews chapter 5. Just to go back, we were reading there just now, concerning the Lord Jesus. But just one more thing that this principle of suffering does in us. In the first verse of Hebrews chapter 5, uh, the Lord Jesus speaks about a high priest. And you'll remember in the Old Testament, in, in, the, in, the, in the nation of Israel, there were high priests who, who served in the house of God. And this, these verses just speak about the qualifications of this high priest. And it says here in verse 1, For every high priest is taken from among men and is ordained for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Now you know the Bible actually speaks about you and I as children of God also being kings and priests unto our God. And having received the Lord Jesus, we've now been separated for His purpose uh, to serve Him in His house. But He says that this high priest, He was a man who could have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way because He Himself was also compassed with infirmity. This high priest was not a man who was high above all the people. You know, in many instances in the church today, we, we have this situation where it's the clergy and the laity. It's the priest and the people. And sometimes there's a a massive separation from those who are, are so, so called the, the hierarchy and, and the congregation. In fact, this principle is so wrong. This high priest was a man who was connected to the people. He was a man who could have compassion on them because he also was a man who was used to infirmity. Doesn't the Bible say about the Lord Jesus that He is touched with the feelings of our infirmities because He's been through what we go through. Yes. He's not far away and, and disconnected from us. Jesus knows exactly what you and I are going through at this very moment and he's able to have compassion because he's been there in fact I think this is crucial for you and I as children of God because I think in these last days in which we live people need compassion we can shout at people we can know every verse in the Bible 
We can think that we have a great ministry and we can shout the odds and, and, and declare what we believe to be the truth. But you know, the fact is, until we can have compassion, our ministry will actually be totally ineffective. People need compassion. They need mercy. And just as the Lord Jesus has had mercy and compassion on us, may we learn to have compassion on one another. But it's going to take suffering. It means we're going to have to go through trials. We're going to have to go through difficulties. It means we're going to have to change the way we pray. Instead of praying and saying, God, take this situation away. We're going to have to pray and say, Father, help me to do your will in this situation. Keep me, Father, but I'm going to do your will. Let that be in our hearts tonight. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, this is a, a great principle, an important principle. And Lord, also a very hard principle for our natural flesh to come to terms with. Because it means that we will have to suffer in the flesh. But Father, if you tonight are able just to give us a glimpse of the joy that this brings you, when you see glorious fruit in our lives as a result of this, when you see great richness and great depth of relationship as a result of this, we read there in the book of Philippians chapter 2 and Lord, as the, the, the scripture just goes on to say there, as the Lord Jesus was willing to humble himself and become obedient to death, even the death of the cross, you, you go on to say, for this reason, God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. And Lord, the truth is, if we are willing to humble ourselves under your mighty hand, you've promised in your word that you will exalt us in due time. You will reward us greatly when we stand before you one day in glory. And Lord, we want to say tonight, that's what we look forward to. That's what we want. We say this, Lord, not lightly. We say this carefully. But we say it with all of our heart. Father, not my will. But thou will be done. Yes, In Jesus' wonderful and precious name. Amen. 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 Praise God. Folks, God bless you. Uh, we look forward to next week again as we continue in God's word and, and uh, by his grace lay the next foundation stone, which is called the laying on of hands, as we've been reading there in Hebrews chapter 6. Look forward to seeing you all again. God bless and keep you all. Amen. Amen.